Um, welcome to the Inclusive Spaces Seminar Series at the Bartlett, the Faculty of the Built Environment here at UCL. Today, you, you join the February edition of Inclusive Spaces titled Visibility, Inclusivity, and Allyship in the Built Environment Profession. I'm Trey Seipel. I'll be moderating the event. Um, this session will be recorded and added to the faculty YouTube channel, Bartlett EDI website, and forwarded to registered attendees. We encourage you to submit questions for the, the speaker at any point during this lecture by clicking the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. You can submit your questions or upvote others. Um, the first half of this will be short introductions and kind of a brief conversation where we'll kind of talk through our experiences. And then um, the second half will be Q&A. So as you hear things or um, interested in things, just please push your questions early enough and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible in the second half of this. Um, this session will be a little bit different than previous ones. We don't have a formal presentation. Um, we are going to just kind of talk about experiences and how to be a good ally, how to be uh, create both an inclusive and open environment, both in your workspace, your uh, lecture hall, and kind of just in your general lifestyle. So um, it's all personal, not research-based, um, at least from my end. And um, we'll just take it from there. So everyone's going to go around and kind of introduce themselves, tell you kind of what they do, a little bit about their experience, and um, who they are. Um, so Anna, do you want to start? Yeah, for sure. Um, my name is Anna Coltrane. I am from, I guess we'll, we'll, I'll make this quick, but we'll start from, I'm from North Carolina. Um, I went to uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, um, graduated back in 2012, immediately moved up to New York and um, got my career started in real estate finance. Um, so I worked in finance for four and a half years and then went and uh, knew I wanted to be on the principal side on the of the business, knew I wanted to develop. So I, um, I went uh, out and did um, development for a couple of different shops, one of which um, uh, was related in New York working on Hudson Yards. Um, and then after that, I worked on a kind of a Silicon Valley tech hybrid that was um, you know, looking to bring technology into multifamily construction. Um, and now I have three partners and we work on development in the Southeast of the US right now. We're expanding from our first market, which is Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and yeah, so my um, kind of experience in the business was, um, or in commercial real estate was very much in first in finance and then, um, now in development and then actually, you know, uh, creating the built environment. So very relevant for this um, conversation. I got married uh, last year. Um, I have a beautiful wife at home um, and two Australian shepherds. And yeah, uh, I like to ski and be outside. I think that's kind of that's kind of me in a nutshell. Cool. Thanks. Adrian, do you want to go next? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Adrian Silver. I, uh, my background is very much not on the principal side. Um, I got started in real estate sustainability and energy efficiency in the built environment, uh, working for a company called Carbon Lighthouse out in San Francisco. And uh, I studied at Columbia University. I'm originally from Boston. I fell in love with cities from a very young age and knew that I wanted to work under the umbrella, the general realm of urban sustainability. And when I learned how much the built environment contributes to climate change, namely somewhere between 30 and 40%, depending on which, how you, how you splice the data, um, I thought, here's this wonderful place where you know landlords can save money and do good and all the incentives are aligned. It's actually a little more complicated than that, but I still maintain that general optimism. Uh, and then I also teach at Columbia University in the master's in real estate program, um, of course, on real estate sustainability and how to rally all the stakeholders, because my perspective from the sales side is um, seeing how much of it is people and change management um, in, to, regarding sustainability, the built environment and getting energy efficiency projects through. Uh, so that's my background, and I'm really happy to be here. On the personal side, um, I live in Harlem, New York with my beautiful partner, um, whom I met at work actually in real estate. So uh, that's uh, that's a fun story. And um, and I'm calling from Mexico City right now where I just love the new remote work environment. We are all jealous as we sit in our cold and gray <laughs> apartments. <laughs> Sam, do you want to kick it off next? Sure, hi, I I'm Sam Chandon. First, let me say, 
uh, you know, Trey and to, to everyone at the Bartlett, I uh, really appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to join you today. Uh, you know, the, the four of us uh, folks have been uh, actively involved in kicking off an organization called the Pride Council that you'll hear a little bit more about uh, over the course of the next hour. But again, really appreciate the opportunity uh, to join you this morning or this afternoon, depending on uh, where you happen to be. Um, I, I'm Sam Chandon. Uh, for the last six years, I've been the Dean of the Shack Institute at NYU, a real estate program uh, at the School of Professional Studies. An opportunity opened up recently uh, to join uh, the finance faculty at the business school. So I've actually shifted over in the last couple of weeks to uh, NYU Stern, uh, where I had the real estate program. Uh, and it's, it's a pretty big tent uh, with the real estate program. We're focusing on a range of different issues, of course, our core real estate finance program, uh, but also issues related to uh, sustainability in the built environment, property technology, data analytics, artificial intelligence, uh, and, and a key one for us under the umbrella of you know, leadership in the built environment um, is uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so th this has been sort of, I think, an area of focus for you know, everyone you're going to hear from today um, and, uh, and one where I think you know, we have ambitions to uh, do our part uh, in making sure that particularly sort of you know, young folks uh, entering the industry from, from college or university, uh, you know, people who may be new to the profession uh, at any stage of their, of their career uh, find that there are uh, people that they recognize, can connect with, uh, that they uh, at no time should ever feel alone or isolated in their particular firm or part of uh, the world. Um, in terms of my academic background, uh, attended uh, Wharton, Princeton, um, and uh, Yale, my cross-trained, or cross-training, I should say, in, in economics finance uh, on one side, but epidemiology on the other, with a particular focus on uh, uh, infectious diseases and, uh, the, uh, and urban spaces. Uh, but uh, Trey, again, thank you. Let me hand it back to you. Yeah, I appreciate that, Sam. And uh, you know, if you're not comfortable answering questions just for everybody or asking questions, you send them directly to myself. If you don't want to put them in the Q and A, um, it's up to you. Um, just as like a side note, but uh, you know, and I'll, I'll kick it off with myself here. Um, I'm Trey Seipel. I um, originally from North Carolina. Also, um, I live in Brooklyn, New York, with my partner. Um, we recently moved here from Queens, so I've now hit three of the five boroughs, um, which is kind of working my way around the city. I think that's about as far as I'll go though. Um, I went to the Bartlett for my master's of international real estate and planning um, in 2011 and 12. And I'm the chair of the New York Alumni Club and a board member of the UCL FAA at, um, which is the UCL's 5013C in New York, um, focusing on creating scholarships as well as um, kind of just building the brand of UCL in the US. So um, my background is I work in real estate finance. Currently, I'm the general manager of construction lending for Pier Street, which is a fractional and lender out of LA. Um, prior to that, I worked in development consulting for 10 years and um, kind of did the opposite of Anna going from <laughs> development into finance, um, getting heavier and heavier into finance and now more technical finance. So um, I think across the board, all of us have very different, but unique experiences. And I think, you know, hopefully this conversation will be pretty opening and encouraging to a lot of people if, um, you know, if you're trying to figure out which direction to go in in real estate or even, you know, it's, um, finding a space where you feel comfortable, you know, hopefully there's some answers here, or at least some, some advice. So we'll start it kind of with the first question for all of us. Um, how do we create a safe, inclusive space within our teams, companies, and industries? Um, you know, you don't want to start that one off. No. Okay. Question. Yeah. <laughs> cold call, cold call, pick one of yeah. us. And <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anna, you want to start with that one? Sure. Um, yeah. So I think, I mean, probably starting at the most, like the center of the nucleus, so to speak, how do we create um, safe and inclusive spaces within our teams? Um, I think there are a lot of, of ways that we do that, but I definitely think that, um, you know, one of the things that we've all talked about and probably can agree is that it starts with visibility. Um, so, you know, learning how to, um, you know, adjust language so that um, it's gender neutral, learning how to, um, you know, uh, be open about uh, our home life. And, you know, I, I ran into situations where 
I was, you know, asked, uh, oh, so like, who's your boyfriend? Or like, you know, very pointed questions like that, which led to this awkward exchange where I had to correct instead of just being like, you know, um, my girlfriend, her name is Jess, you know, and kind of like now my wife, but like being um, normalizing, I think those kinds of interactions brings visibility, which can permeate, you know, an entire culture. Um, and so at least for, you know, my way of walking the walk was definitely when I came out and um, got more comfortable with myself was to, um, you know, be very open about who I was and um, how, you know, uh, it just be visible, be more visible than I was um, previously, because I think that if I had someone, if I had, you know, somebody that I had seen within my firm or within within commercial real estate in general, frankly, who was uh, open and out and, um, you know, not like, uh, you know, just, just operating under a normal, in a normal capacity, but was, uh, you know, open about who they were, then um, I could have maybe, you know, had kind of the leadership had the example to emulate, um, which uh, would have been helpful at, at various stages. Um, so I think visibility is a big one. I think there's a lot of different areas we could go, but I'll, I'll leave it at visibility and let somebody else pipe in. No, and I actually think that's, that's yeah, the, the great part of that, that start of the topic is visibility. You know, it doesn't have to mean you have to, you know, wear a rainbow flag or run around <laughs> or even like, you know, be as, open, but like just creating a safe space by being visible and being an ally in that, that environment is, I think, very helpful for creating a comfortable workplace, not only for LGBTQIA+, but for just anybody in general, um, and being a visible ally to, to everybody, yeah. Adrian, you are going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to provide a, a little anecdote or story that I think demonstrates that, because I, I remember that one of the probably the most public setting in which I came out in the industry was for an urban land institute council, which are these closed groups of 20 to 40 people who have specialized interest and deep experience in a topic. And so the average age is probably 45 plus. I was by far the youngest person in the room. And I had recently joined, I recently learned and joined the gay real estate group in New York. That visibility of seeing so many out open and successful professionals who, um, who, who I was able to emulate was the visibility that gave me the courage to, in that environment, to the other council members in a, in a semi-public forum, simply just say, and we were doing, you know, three intro slides on ourselves saying, you know, this is what I do for work. This is who I am at home. And, oh, by the way, like, this is something I'm really excited about professionally that recently developed. I joined this gay real estate group. And little did I know, I thought that wasn't that big of a deal because I'd seen the gay real estate group and I'd seen that happen. Little did I know, there were actually two other older members of the group who, in their entire 30 plus year career in real estate, had an, and, and, you know, four plus year membership in this group, had not come out actively to anyone in the group. And my stepping forward in that particular example actually opened the door for them. They came to me privately afterwards and said, you know, wow, I'm, I'm really impressed with your courage. And I was like, there's, there's no courage. It's, it's 2020. It's not that big of a deal. I guess it would have been 2018, 2019. Um, it's not that big of a deal. You know, we're in modern day, but that I feel like those are the kinds of, you know, unwitting examples of casual visibility that end up opening the door for others to, to walk through the same. And again, to reemphasize, like I would not have done that or thought, I would have probably thought twice about it if there hadn't been this demonstrable example of the gay real estate group of this, you know, nucleus of wonderful professionals and someone had to start that 20 years ago when it wasn't easy. Um, so yeah, I, I really, that hits home visibility, I think is, is definitely. Great, Sam, did, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, sure. I, I think sort of, you know, echoing sort of Adrian and, and Anna's uh, points, you know, visibility being incredibly important. If I were to dial back 10 years, uh, I think that one of the things that's changed more recently is that, you know, at that time, um, you know, if I had been looking for sort of a job in the private sector, you know, and certainly for some of my students, I might have looked for firms that were saying the right things about sort of, you know, that, that might have an inclusion policy that included LGBTQIA+. Plus. The, uh, and taking that as a strong signal, you know, of their commitment to, to being an inclusive and supportive environment. Fast forward, certainly over the last couple of years, 
every firm in our industry has learned how to say the right things um, and knows you know that it's important that they say the right things. Uh, but I think sort of as uh, you know, folks looking for opportunities in industry, particularly the students at the Bartlett or or anywhere else, um, you know, we're smarter consumers uh, than we were um, and better informed consumers than we were ten years ago. Um, and for a company to say the right thing uh, is uh, quite frankly not enough. Uh, we're going to look for visibility. And I'd suggest that there is a big difference. And one of the things that we should all be looking for is visibility across uh, the uh, different levels of the organization. Um, and we see this when we're looking at uh, not only LGBTQIA uh, visibility and inclusion in the organization, but you know, across a broad spectrum of diversity. Uh, within firms that uh, there are many firms that may be uh, you know, achieving uh, their uh, inclusion targets or goals uh, at the level of the analyst or the young associate. But as you move further up in the hierarchy of that organization, and particularly when you look at sort of the senior management teams, um, it starts to look a lot more traditional. Um, and I think that is a very powerful signal about whether or not uh, as a diverse person, however that uh, diversity is expressed, you know, whether or not within you know, that particular organization, there is an opportunity for you to find a champion for yourself, whether there's an opportunity for you to find a, a mentor for yourself, whether you'll have the same opportunities you know, to work hard, be recognized and advance within that organization. So I think uh, you know, when I'm talking to students today, you know, those are the kinds of things that I think people are looking for, much stronger signals that not only are you an organization that's going to welcome me as someone right out of college or university, but you know, are you going to be a, a supportive organization as well, where you know, my opportunities for advancement uh, are going to be a function of my effort and my accomplishments and my contributions. So you know, all of those things part and parcel with you know, saying the right stuff, having the right policies in place, you know, having the sort of the flexibility to support people uh, with uh, you know different backgrounds, experiences, and needs uh, that you know, often have to balance different you know types of obligations uh, you know between sort of you know, their home life uh, and their work life. Uh, you know, those are sort of, you know, all of the things that I think are increasingly important for organizations that. You know, really want to, and I may be dating myself with this expression, want to walk the walk uh, in showing that uh, their, their commitment to diversity and inclusion within the organization is real. And that actually leads into another, another great question. Um, when you started a firm, when you look at a firm, even for, you know, hunting for um, a job, are there other things that you would look for either in their website, in their bio? Is it, is it their board? Is it their, their C-suite? Or is it, you know, interactions with people. Is there an easy way to kind of to streamline through that process of hiring or job? Yeah, searching? well, I mean, I think we're looking at a large firm. Certainly, you know, look at the management team, look at the board. You know, uh, you know, see whether or not you know they're they value because I think it is a strong signal. You know, when looking at their management team and their C-suite executives, is there clear evidence that they value a diversity of background and experience, or is it the case as we see? For so many firms in the real estate industry over the last couple of years, that there are selective appointments uh, being made to senior roles that are ultimately performative. Because um, if that's the case, that comes across you know, quite differently in terms of what it signals about the value of diverse opinions. Is there someone on the investment committee? Um, is there uh, you know, someone in you know, who's tasked with sort of you know, an important function you know, on the board? Uh, that is, you know, diverse, again, however that diversity expresses itself. I think, you know, th those are, are key things uh, to look for, uh, as well as sort of, you know, the, 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 the broader picture and landscape of sort of, you know, what's being said on the website. Um, I think one of the challenges we face in real estate is that, you know, many of the firms to which, you know, we will want, that, that we'll want to go work for are relatively smaller than may be the case in, you know, sort of a traditional, you know, finance role. Um, and for a smaller firm, uh, it can be more difficult or challenging uh, to sort of, you know, express those values because they don't have a critical mass of LGBTQIA persons that are part of the organization. But I think, you know, for that smaller firm, there are many, many other ways uh, in which they can express um, that, you know, their, their commitment to supporting uh, sort of, you know, diverse 
uh, a diverse uh, pool of, of people, whether it's through their, the way in which they, they engage with vendors, clients, uh, whether it's you know, the, the, the associations that they partner with. So there are avenues and opportunities for firms uh, you know, across the spectrum uh, to you know, clearly demonstrate and signal that commitment um, and that it's part of their DNA. But, but I think for, you know, we, we do have to recognize that for firms of different scale, not everyone is going to be sort of a CBRE or another sort of you know, very large global services organization that has a critical mass of people that's able to support sort of you know, you know, the, the infrastructure uh, that, that, that you might see there. Yeah, and I think, Sam, that's when asking questions as a candidate becomes pretty critical, right? You know, just asking questions about policies and, um, you know, uh, mentorship groups or advocacy, you know, uh, of any sort. I mean, I think it's, it can be across, you know, it can be a variety of different things in addition to looking at, you know, the, the groups of people that make up their senior staff. I think that's a great hack, so to speak, for like, you know, looking at whether or not they walk the walk, um, to steal your expression, Sam. Um, but I do think that, Candidates don't realize the power that they have. I mean, we we are actively and always seeking incredible talent to join our, our team. And that has been the case at every firm, every real estate firm I've ever worked at. And um, I mean, it is, it is, especially in this job environment, at least for, for us, it is very much the, uh, the employer seeking the candidate. And, um, and that's how it should be, frankly. But um, I think if, you know, if you, if there's not enough for you to sniff out around critical mass, as you mentioned, Sam, and, um, and, you know, if there, I think, you know, looking at the website is great, because sometimes you can see, um, you know, values that drive the firm and that sort of thing. Again, that's a little bit of like, they can throw up anything, but if you get in there, I mean, you have the power, so ask questions. And I think that that is a great, that's also a great signal to, you know, the, the people internally. I mean, if you have an HR manager who's going back and is like, this kid just asked me about like what our HR policy is around like sexual discrimination in the office and like gender orientation, then like you have a major problem. Like that, those need to be like very quick answers. Um, and, and if you're, you know, and, and there's a little bit of investigation that has to happen on the candidate side to, um, to see whether or not like the answers are uh, past the sniff test of, you know, I'm doing this because it's PC or I'm doing this because it's actually a, a deeply ingrained value that our firm holds. And, um, you know, this is a place that you can uh, be successful, right? Which is kind of what you're, what you're trying to suss out as a, as a um, potential candidate to join a, a firm. So I think asking questions is the other thing I would encourage people to do. Yeah, and you can also, I mean, it is 2022 now, you can look at most of these firms track record and you can kind of see, you know, did they get into this in 2018? Did they, have mm -hmm. they been trying to build a very diverse and, you know, income, all encompassing community? LinkedIn is a great source that you can go through and just kind of click around and see what they're involved with, where they are, how long, where people have come from, where people have worked from. So you can kind of see how people have come and gone from the firm and, you know, it's, it's the internet and it's, it's there forever. <laughs> um, so um, another question I was going to uh, lead to the next one is, you know, was there someone in your first job or your second job that kind of was an ally for you or, you know, kind of was that person who made you feel comfortable to be yourself in your role? You don't have to give names. You don't have to give specifics if you don't want to. Um, but, you know, there's always that first job where you, you have to kind of not only have your first job and set it up, but also be yourself and figure out your balance of personal and professional life. Does anyone, I, I can start, I mean, my first job in New York City, I worked for a brokerage house and uh, my first boss, I mean, I guess we never really had the conversation, but I knew he was, he was gay as well. And it was, you know, a very open environment. Brokerage in general um, is pretty, pretty open and accepting in New York, at least um, my experience. And our C-suite was very much the same way. And um, it was a very comfortable place to work and to you know, feel fully accepted, but also to be able to talk about my personal life and you know, just kind of everything that went with it. So you know, that was something that I felt very comfortable about. Um, 
you know, I think it might have been a little bit different if I had stayed in other parts of the U.S. or kind of gone to a little bit different field. But working in analytics and in brokerage was very helpful um, and very, very eye-opening. It was my first job in New York. It was my first job in general. And so it kind of was a, a very good experience. Anyone else want to? I think. Uh, for, for myself, I think that uh, you know, my first private sector role, and I should, I should preface this by saying in academia, lots of champions, um, sort of an incredibly inclusive and supportive environment. And I, I should qualify that by saying, you know, I realized that you know, I, you know, many of us have been very lucky to be in academic environments that, you know, have been very inclusive and welcoming um, and supportive and where there has been that sort of you know, critical mass of, you know, both at, allies and and other uh, people who identify as LGBTQIA. Um, the, uh, but that's not, I sh you know, I shouldn't assume that that's going to be the case sort of in every academic setting. Um, the, but on the private sector side, I have historically gravitated towards very small firms. And you know, when I was starting my career, I think that uh, I, I did not have anyone, you know, in that particular first firm uh, where I felt like it uh, would not be anything but sort of you know, uh, dangerous to my career uh, to come out. And um, the, you know, sort of, you know, the, you know, the, the physical and emotional and psychological stress of having to live a lie in your workplace, particularly when you're an analyst, an analyst in a role where you're very likely spending almost all of your you know, waking time at work uh, was really, really tough. Um, and I eventually left that role because, uh, it was not an environment in which I felt like I could safely, you know, uh, come out the, and I think that, that should be a lesson, you know, back to Anna's point about through, you know, the, you know, where we are in the labor market cycle right now, that's a lesson for every single employer out there that if you want to compete, uh, for, you know, the best talent, um, you've got to be inclusive. Uh, otherwise, that best talent is going to go somewhere else. Um, the uh, given the, the preponderance of uh, relatively small firms in our industry, uh, in that you know we're going to have a lot of folks that do find themselves in a small uh, firm setting, particularly if you're on the development side, that might be even more likely than sort of on the finance or investment side. Or if you're in private equity, which you know the average firm size tends to be quite small as well. Uh, just one more plug for Pride Council. I think that it's not necessarily the case that you're going to find, uh, you know, that you know, mentor uh, within your own firm. Uh, um, sometimes it's going to be the case that you can and should be able to rely upon sort of a broader community of LGBTQ persons in the built environment to support you. And I think, you know, again, for, for younger folks uh, and students on uh, the call today, the thing that I would want to emphasize is that, uh, you know, part of the reason the four of us are here is because we want to signal so strongly to you that you do have friends and allies and mentors in the industry. We're here to support you um, and to stand by you so that if there isn't that person uh, within the organization where you end up in your first career, uh, know that there is a larger community uh, of professionals uh, who uh, are here to uh, to be with you and to support you. Amen, Sam. Amen. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. Um, my story, my first job was out in San Francisco. So on a relative basis, I would say fairly easy to come out, but it did take me, I don't think I was out for my entire first year. Um, and mine was a bit of a funny double whammy. So I, I was, the, the company was 30, it was a 30 person startup. And, uh, my partner, of my now partner of six years, um, had joined the company. And so I say it's a double whammy because I both came out at work to, to our boss, um, and the one person in HR, and this was obviously before there was a policy on workplace relationships. So we wanted to get out in front of it, <laughs> um, as, as well. So I basically came out in a relationship and also as gay in, in the workplace all at once, which was a lot for, <laughs> for my boss, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's my story. <laughs> you know, I think this is yeah. actually a really important, important part of this, you know, these small firms across the, across the, the globe, there's not always a, an HR department necessarily, or even like a, a DEI script or program kind of in place. And so I think Sam's right where he talks about the, the Pride Council being a, a great outlet or a great resource for 
um, young professionals as well as companies in general trying to figure out how to engage better with new hires, but also their current employees and figure out a better path forward for their entire company outlook. I think, you know, that's something that, you know, the Pride Council can actually give a lot of lift to. And there's both a young committee and a, a regular committee, <laughs> the, for lack of a, a better word, um, that actually kind of can give that support, um, both through research and through all kind of other aspects of it. And um, we did get a, a great question, you know, um, a, and this is, we're gonna kind of shift a little bit, but according to you, what will the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on the future of inclusivity and full inclusion of all groups of humanity in the human society? So, you know, we are, as everyone's very well aware, still in this pandemic and still keeping distance and working remotely, most of us, and um, not socially interacting on a face-to-face -face level. Um, so what do we think the long impacts of that will be? You know, one thing I'll kind of just start with is, you know, you're all in my house right now. And so mm -hmm. while it feels a little bit less personal, it's a lot more personal at the same time. Um, and so I think depending on how you engage with your colleagues, with your friends, with even new acquaintances, um, some of it can be a little more personal and you can feel a little more safety some people feel a little more safe in the internet environment of not be having to socially engage in that way. And so I think it'll, it has opened a new dialogue of how we engage with our, our colleagues, but also might allow for a lot more openness than we actually anticipated. For sure. Uh, you know, Trey, looking at it through, the, you know, through an e economic lens and sort of the dynamics of the labor market that Anna mentioned, you know, I think one of the things that this has done, um, is to force a reevaluation on the part of many people in terms of how they want to prioritize uh, sort of you know, their again sort of you know, to you know, paint a broad brushstroke your know, work life balance uh, sort of you know, uh, how they think about uh, you know the importance of location um, speaking to you know Adrian being in Mexico City the um, but you know the, they're not just because of the relative tightness of the labor market today uh, but you know because of this review a reevaluation of priorities uh, that the pandemic has motivated that I think will exhibit some persistence. Uh, won't simply you know, fall by the wayside a year from now or two years from now or whenever it is that we find ourselves in an endemic environment for COVID-19. Um, but that places a greater onus on the employer uh, to be an attractive place, whether it's a virtual or real place, you know, to the employee. And you know, as that bargain or a contract, implicit or explicit, between the employee and the employer shifts. Um, you know, I, I think you know, part of the legacy of COVID-19 um, is that you know, every employer needs to be thinking more carefully about how it is that they not only attract, but also retain and advance a diverse set of employees. That is something that, you know, as a community, we should not be bashful or shy about taking full advantage of. Um, in supporting one another and uh, our, our advancement in our uh, respective careers. But I think there is an important labor market dynamic here that has shifted uh, as a result of, uh, of the pandemic. And that's coincided with because the pandemic has highlighted so many of the extraordinary disparities you know, in uh, you know, society and the labor force, not just in the United States where the you know, three of the four of us are right now, uh, but uh, you know, in other parts of the world as well. Many of those disparities are focused on you know, historical injustices, socioeconomic uh, disparities uh, in the economy and in the labor force. Uh, but I think you know, that has also uh, opened the door to a larger conversation about disparities in economic opportunity for diverse peoples. Yeah, well, we'll uh, go to the next question here. You know, um, this is a great question. And it's, uh, why is it important to come out in the workplace? And is it necessary? And what does it involve even if your workplace is inclusive? Um, I think Anna kind of touched on this originally with the, the visibility, um, but do either of y'all or any of y'all wanna add anything else to this? Yeah, I think it's a great, it's a great question. I think first and foremost, it's not necessary. I mean, that's my opinion. Um, I don't think that anyone needs to, 
feel like they need to come forward, just like anyone who does come forward doesn't need to take on the burden of educating the greater group on, um, you know, on kind of uh, language or um, what, you know, what your life entails. Um, I think that there's no burden on the employee. It's more on the company and setting up either organizations that you can join from an advocacy perspective or actual like, um, you know, HR policies and that sort of thing. The burden lies on the company to kind of come up with that. Um, I don't, so I don't think that there's any obligation. Um, for me personally, I couldn't be, what it eventually came to for me, I came out when I was 25. So I was kind of older, I guess, than your average. Um, I was two and a half years in at um, East Hill Secured, which was a very inclusive environment, but I personally was just not ready to, um, you know, kind of be open. Um, and it was, uh, you know, I got, a, I got a promotion, which I think gave me a little boost of confidence, frankly. Um, and I, I just, it just, there became a, a line in the sand for me and a fork in the road where I couldn't be half of myself anymore um, in a workplace culture. The people meant too much to me. I had, you know, I was very much that analyst that Sam mentioned that was, uh, you know, working 100 to 120 hour work weeks and um, was uh, really passionate about their job. And that meant that I spent a lot of time with the people that I worked for and I cared a lot about them and they cared a lot about me. And um, eventually, after two and a half years, I mean, that was far too long for my own just like personal sanity to not be open about who I was. And so it, and it was incredibly empowering to, you know, kind of finally share that with them. And I was, I think, shocked at the, uh, the, the like, I mean, first of all, it was, it was very supportive, but it was also, um, a fairly like, okay, you know, and what'd you have for breakfast this morning? You know, it was, um, you know, very, uh, it, which was very helpful to me in normalizing everything um, and kind of realizing that this was not going to be this devastating um, thing that I was going to tell people that was going to, you know, shake the ground that they walked on. They were like, wonderful. Like, is there anything that we can do to help as you go through this um, kind of experience of coming out in the workplace? So, I, do you need to? No. Would I encourage it? Um, I, from my personal experience, it was very impactful for me. It also led to all kinds of other connections being made. Um, you know, people, when you share something private and you are private and you are vulnerable um, in your, um, you know, just in information sharing, I think people tend to respond with vulnerability as well, which can deepen uh, relationships and connections. So for me, it has been um, a wonderful thing to share and it's been very empowering to me and it allows me to bring my full self into the office every day. But I don't think that anyone is under any obligation to do anything that they don't wanna do. Um, no, I'll echo that. I, I think it's important that, you know, you have to feel comfortable in the space. And if you aren't comfortable, even if it is an inclusive office, kind of announcing that or even being open with colleagues, then it is your personal experience and how you engage with it. So um, I don't think there's any requirement to be to be open, to be out, but you can still be an ally without being open. Um, you can create a safe space that is um, fosters that that same feeling um, without having to disclose your identity um, across that, you know any of it. For sure. Um, we have another great question actually from Luke here. Um, so the question is in the U.S. Con in the UCL is in the U.K. as we know. Um, in the U.S. context, do people choose their state for how open and inclusive it is before applying to live and work there? Um, and I think, you know, that applies to most places, you know, some cities are a little bit more open and accepting and you kind of know that from either the news or from kind of location or even density of other aspects of it. Um, but I mean, I'm from North Carolina and North Carolina over the history of the last 10 years has had some ups and downs with their battles for the, the LGBTQIA community. And um, even the South has a bad reputation, but not all of the South is as um, conservative as as one has historically seen. So, you know, I think it has less to do about the state and more about the city and location and the people you work with um, and where you engage. But does anyone else have a, an opinion on that? 
Yeah, I think, I think sort of this dovetails sort of with my colleague Richard Florida's sort of creative class thesis that you know competitive cities are going to be ones that uh, you know signal and are sort of you know, uh, you know attractive to folks from from diverse backgrounds, and that by bringing together sort of you know that you know diversity background experience, you know thought process uh, that. Uh, you'll be a more creative and ultimately more c competitive city. Uh, we don't want to sort of you know, miss you know the gentrification elements. You don't want to miss sort of you know, the you know, sort of you know, the important fisc local fiscal policy and tax policy elements of what makes cities competitive because there's there's a lot going on besides sort of uh, you know just being open to and attractive to folks from, from different backgrounds. Um, the I, you know I, the, the data does sort of suggest that. Yes, people of different backgrounds are going to, you know, you know, look for um, and are going to prioritize, you know, places that um, are going to be welcoming, um, and and that does tend to favor large cities. The the one thing Trey that I'd probably contest is that um, while we absolutely do see you know, vast differences in social and cultural norms and behaviors. Um, when in some of let's say again, I don't want to, I don't want to fall back on say sort of southern states, northern states, or red versus blue, but you know, where there are parts of the country um, where uh, you know, uh, you know, at the state level, uh, it's perceived as being more conservative. We'll mm -hmm. often uh, also observe you know a significant difference um, in what's happening in the largest urban areas, and so. You know, uh, you know, Austin, I think, is a very good example of a city where, you know, that is perceived and seen as being more open and inclusive than perhaps the larger context in which it lives. Mm -hmm. While that's true, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the one qualifier, I think, is that, you know, Austin still exists within the larger context of a state that in some cases is adopting statewide policies that are mm -hmm. going to apply and bind on Austin, no matter how you know, progressive you know, the, the local electorate is, uh, that uh, you know, I think are going to give you know, LGBTQIA people pause. And certainly you know, Florida is another state where you know, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen legislation introduced or, or policies introduced that you know, I'm not a parent. Uh, I, everyone else mentioned their partner. If I don't, I'm gonna get into big trouble. We live on the Upper West Side. Um, the, uh, but I think you know if I if, if we had a child, you know I would have to think very very carefully around sort of you know what norms are being set, um, you know for uh, school age children in that mm -hmm. state. And if uh, you know my son or daughter was not able to speak openly and might even be sanctioned for be you know talking about his or her two dads, uh, you know it doesn't matter whether you're in Fort Lauderdale. It doesn't matter whether you're in Wilton Manors. Um, you know, you're, 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 you know, both of those places exist within sort of a, a larger state context that matters. Yeah, I mean, Florida is a great example of this. They just rolled out even further restrictions today or the past two days um, and on school age children. And for those in the UK who don't know, um, Florida is kind of trying to put in some legislation to limit the ability to, I think, use the word gay in school as a possibility of indoctrinating new members to the club, so they say. Um, and it's kind of a one of those situations where now I think they said if you teachers are required, if they suspect a child to be LGBTQIA, um, to they're now required to out them to their parents legally. That's kind of what they're trying to introduce as the second phase of that bill. Um, regardless of if it puts the child at harm at home. So um, Florida is trying some of these things. And I think, think Sam, that's a, actually a very valid point. Um, you know, North Carolina did the same thing with some of their, their transphobia back a couple years ago. Um, you see it still coming up in Kentucky and Tennessee, regardless of all the things that are, um, the positive things that are going on in those states. Um, but I think there is still a, a grassroots movement, especially in the South. Um, you saw it in Atlanta, kind of how Georgia is kind of making some turns. Um, and even the Georgia legislator kind of stood up a little bit for some of these things. Um, but it's state by state level, there are those issues. I think you kind of have the same thing in the UK. But Charlie asked actually a great question to kind of follow up on this is, you know, the question is for um, geographically centralized neighborhoods better than scattered ones. Like 
In other words, he, he used the example of Manchester's Gay Village versus London Soho, Clapham Vauxhall, um, King's Cross, Smile End. And, uh, you know, is there a benefit for being in a centralized neighborhood for, for anything? Um, you know, because he the, the other example here is the Manchester stood together to protest the commercialization of pride back in the day. Um, but also when hate crimes, crimes happened in the gay village, the people voiced more loudly. Um, does anyone want to speak on that? I mean, I, I'll say even from coming from North Carolina, you know, the neighborhood downtown and the town I lived in in Raleigh um, was a very strong, tight knit neighborhood. And it kind of, while we were still fairly small relative to the size of both Manchester, London, New York, San Francisco, it did feel very um, comfortable, but also safer um, in some aspects, especially as I was trying to figure out who I was and go through the entire process of coming out and self-realization um, in my early 20s. And so I think there is a, a benefit to it. Um, I think there's also something to be said for um, self-isolation um, and what that kind of does in the long run. I don't know if it's positive or negative, um, but I think ability to interact and engage with people who are different from you only makes you a better person. Um, and being in a, a population of only people like-minded, like yourself exactly, can also lead to its own problems. Yeah, I'd say that, you know, Trey, there's, I mean, there's sort of a, sort of a basic urban agglomeration argument here that sort of if you've got folks with sort of, you know, a you know, shared set of, uh, you know, shared demand profile in terms of goods or services, um, then, you know, some concentration, uh, you, know, uh, you know, there's some benefit that derives from concentration. And it's not necessarily the case that, okay, you get a bunch of guys together and so you've got the critical mass to provide sort of, you know, sort of, you know, a, sort of you know, a bar or sort of, you know, a clothing store. It can also be that when you've got that concentration, you've got a set of you know, suppliers and vendors and retailers in the neighborhood uh, that uh, are not going to refuse to make your cake, you know. Um, so there, you know, there, there are sort of, you know, benefits that accrue. Um, the, I think sort of an ideal circumstance is, and I should say also your point's very well taken that, you know, it's, it, it's a safe space to come home to, and there's value in that. Perhaps sort of, you know, the ideal scenario is one where you do have a neighborhood, you know, where you do have a critical mass of people where this, you know, sort of, you know, it is a safe space where, um, you know, there are sort of, you know, goods and services offered that, you know, are meeting the needs of the community, whether it just be in terms of not having to worry about sort of, you know, mentioning to your barber, uh, that, you know, uh, that, that you have a, you know, same-sex partner at home. Um, the, uh, uh, but at the same time, sort of, so imagine sort of a scenario where you have the benefit of being able to access that community uh, and that concentration, but you don't need it. Mm -hmm. um, what you don't want is a scenario where, you know, that concentration exists because people feel they need and must have that safe space to go to. Uh, it exists sort of, uh, you, know, for, uh, you know, but because it's there for us to take advantage of, you know, but we elect in as opposed to sort of feeling like, you know, we need to retreat. No, that's a great point. Yeah, I agree. I think it, it kind of breaks down in this whole like question of, um, you know, scattered versus concentrated. I think it breaks down to what you want in a community. Um, you know, I mean, I think that there's, um, there's a lot of benefits that you, that you guys have done a great job of kind of outlining of living in like the hell's kitchen of New York, so to speak, but um, community can involve a lot of different factors and can be, um, you know, it's about what, what fills your cup and makes you, uh, you know, feel um, kind of uh, completed and, and safe, you know, first and foremost, but then what you, what you like to rub up against in the world, you know, um, and what that kind of looks like in a community orientation, that could be a really diverse area, or that could be, um, you know, that could be West Village in New York, and it could be very quaint and quiet and familial. And, you know, I mean, I think it's just, um, you know, we're at, at my current company, Spacecraft, we're very passionate about just building neighborhoods, and we have like a very strong, um, inclination towards uh, diverse 10 minute neighborhoods where, you know, you can kind of uh, grab everything. You have a pharmacy, you have, um, you know, food and beverage, you have bars, you have the ability to grab a salad when you, you know, are coming out of 
you, when you want to grab lunch or something like that. I think those kinds of communities for me are what I get really excited and really passionate about. And it involves a lot of different groups of people. Um, but I think that there's huge merit in, you know, kind of being in, um, in those concentrated communities as well. I think it's, it's about going, experiencing and deciding what's, uh, you know, what kind of nurtures you and allows you to be the best version of yourself. That's, that's a great point. I think we have time for one last question. Um, Shmuel, who actually asked our first question, um, kind of asked the idea of how do you build suitable allyships to reach full inclusivity? Um, and what does that kind of look like to everybody? I mean, will there be full inclusivity ever? Or is it, you know, are people scared of the, the unknown? I, I think, Shreel, you've asked so many great questions uh, mm -hmm. and, and made so many great comments uh, today. Thank you. The, um, uh, I think sort of, you know, one of the things sort of that we're learning to do in the industry is to approach issues around diversity and inclusion more broadly and holistically. So it's not just about, okay, what is our strategy for people of color? What is our strategy for women in our company? Um, but how do we think about, um, you know, creating an environment that is broadly inclusive because um, you know, there are always going to be people by definition that bring differences to the table that make them unique mm -hmm. and, and special. It's not just about identifying two or three very specific, you know, you know group identifiable groups. And it really also raises a critically important point that, you know, even within the LGBTQIA community, we're still thinking and learning about how to be um, respectful of and inclusive of intersectionality. Uh, that you know, people don't only have one identity, and uh, when you have you know many shared identities or overlapping identities, you know that creates sort of unique scenarios. Um, the uh, sort of you know, and I think you know Anna mentioned this. You know, it, it's you know a lot of the times folks hesitate because they don't want to be in the position of having to educate their entire organization or speak on behalf of an entire people. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the, that's not something any one of us was sort of appointed or elected to do. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, thinking about how we can um, you know, recognize, celebrate, and be supportive of uh, intersectionality as part of our larger diversity and inclusion effort, uh, I, I think, you know, again, is critically important. Yeah, I think this is an awesome question to think about because I think it, the work is probably never done um, as we evolve as a human species. Inevitably, more and more minority populations, whether they're um, physically disabled, whether racial or nationality or gender orientation or sexual orientation, we will continue to kind of know ourselves better and evolve. Um, and so the work is probably never done. Um, and for me, and what we try to think about a lot, as we are actually, you know, kind of crafters of space in terms of the built environment, the space itself is not what's special, right? Like, it can be special, but what happens in the space is what's actually special. That's, you know, where you go to vacation in your hotel room, where you go to the doctor where you go to work every day, where you live. I mean, those are, you know, people's homes. Those are, it is the people that make them special. And so what we try to think about is collecting the most diverse and, um, you know, just integrated group of people that we can around the beauty of, of real estate is it requires a lot of people to come to the table to, you know, make these spaces. You've got architects, consultants, engineers, builders, uh, financiers, you know, debt providers, equity providers. I mean, this touches such a broad swath of, um, of you know, kind of the job market and just, uh, you know, population in general, that how can you make that table big and inclusive and make the people who are actually crafting the spaces um, who have unique perspectives, you know, as um, diverse as possible, because that will, at the end of the day, will enable a space to adhere to, you know, kind of their personal experiences um, and allow them to have fingerprints on, you know, kind of what you're um, actually building that are better for a larger pool of people. And I think the other part of that really is, you know, being able to listen 
um, you know, that's kind of helped build a very inclusive space. If you can listen to the people around you and listen to their experiences and engage with them and uh, try to empathize rather than fully understand where they're coming from. I think that, you know, not only creating a space that is more inclusive and comfortable, but um, making someone feel comfortable in that space. Um, that's something that I think is a big, big part of it. People have to feel comfortable being themselves in the space that they engage in and they live in. And even events like, you know, events like this inclusive space series or the pride council that starts a conversation that people can then listen to and understand a different perspective that's not necessarily their own. Um, and that's kind of something that, you know, for, for lack of a better thing, the U S has lost a little bit of that over the past couple of years, the ability to engage in like a, a manner that's compassionate. Um, so, um, I'm just going to wrap up, I guess, guys, I really want to thank everyone for joining today. Um, it's been a pleasure to kind of speak to y'all and listen to your questions and kind of hear everyone's perspective on this. Um, Inclusive uh, Spaces is back next Wednesday or Wednesday, the 16th of March with Inclusive Space Exploring Gender Inequality in the Built Environment. Um, the details are in the chat um, and I hope you all can join and see you all there. Thank you. Everyone have Thanks, a great. Thanks, all. Thanks very much.